Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you all are doing as well as you can be, given that at least on the upside, it's Friday, and that means that some of us could uh, maybe, you know, sleep in until uh, the sun comes up or something like that tomorrow, which is like, you know, 11 a.m. or something crazy. Anyways, um, I want to get started uh, with some obvious logistical points. Uh, yeah, oh, I received a helpful comment that it's, um, yeah, afternoon. I might have said morning. These things happen. Um, oops, that's, uh, distinctly not what I want. I want that. All right, so, uh, yeah, as you may have seen straight from the president's desk, uh, our online classes will be continuing, uh, in this way until February 28th, which is basically the first half of the term. Uh, we're here. We're... It, this is it. Um, we don't get to make these decisions. We just get to live with them. <sighs> Alas, um, I don't really love being here, but we're going to try to make the best of it uh, as, as well as we can. If you have some suggestions on how things are going and what we could do to make them better, please let me know. I'm, uh, I'm all ears. This is this is distinctly not ideal, but uh, yeah, you know, give me, uh, give me, give me your ideas here. Uh, I try to be online and present on Discord so we can at least chat that way. Uh, but if you have other ideas, uh, let me know. Anyways, homework one is due today at 5 p.m. Homework due to due next Friday. Um, I want to note that I was going to do the Constance quiz back when we got into person, and that's uh, clearly not happening anytime soon. So uh, I'm going to see if I can get it into the second half of the term. I'll give you two weeks minimum notice as to when that happens for in person. If we, for horrible reasons, have to sort of defer our return to in-person classes uh, again, I'm just going to do it online. I mean, it's basically a quick exercise. It's not worth a lot. Easy marks, but, you know, something that I think is really useful. Uh, we'll just do it uh, online and call it is what, it, say it is what it is. Uh, but it does mean that midterm one is going to be online via e-class. I don't think we have compelling reason to come in for an in-person class uh, assessment. Some of your classes may require in-person assessments and there are going to be some requests and approvals. So stay tuned with that. I don't think we have the justification to say it's really worth us getting together in person to do this. But I had a question about that for you. And the question is going out on the e-poll. Um, and the question is, uh, nominally, I was going to do this all with a uh, formula sheet, two-sided, whatever you write on top of it. Uh, but given we're going to be remote for all of this, I'd propose we could maybe do this open book instead, uh, which basically means that you have your PDF of your book uh, available for that. So let me know via ePoll which one you would sort of think. We can do the formula sheet, which is sort of status quo. You can send me pictures of your formula sheets, I like that. Or if you think it would just be better, like, you know, I don't want to try to heavily enforce something that's not easy to enforce, I, we could just say that this is open book uh, here. So yeah, let me know what your thoughts are online, uh, about online exams. Um, as I've noted, I haven't really run this, so I don't know what's uh, the, you know, best route from your perspective as to how things go. I've got some ideas for useful assessments here, uh, here, but, you know, given your experiences and, you know, how this is going, I just want to know what your thoughts are. Uh, we could just do this open book. Um, informing your answer, you should probably know that open book means that I ask different questions than if it's just a formula sheet. And, you know, I'm not going to be asking sort of factual recall stuff that you can control F your way through a PDF. Uh, so given that, let's see what we think. All right, take a couple more seconds, plug in your answers, and we will close. All right, um, let's see what we got. All right, uh, so we've got a slight lean towards open book. Um, uh, we'll look at that going forward. So I'll sort of think about what that means uh, and go forward. If you've got specific commentary that I think I should be aware of in making this decision, uh, let me know via Discord or via email. All right, 
Uh, so, coming back to the broadcast. Um, today, what we're going to do is we'll do a quick wrap up on kind of parallaxes and magnitudes uh, and stuff. And then we're going to move over. It's Friday, so we'll talk about something that's sort of data and researchy. And today, we're going to be talking about journal articles. Um, and we're going to close out at the end with you know, a basically go forth and read a chunk of a journal article. And then next Friday, we'll be doing some exercises with that reading and finding some journal articles here. Uh, and it's all about a journal article about what we are research or what we are learning about in class. Uh, so this is how it's going to kind of come together for us. So uh, that's the thinking uh, here. So let's uh, get a quick uh, run through magnitudes. So the last time uh, we spoke, I was going to ask you this question, which is if a star has an absolute magnitude of plus 3.1 and a parallax of 50 milli arc seconds, what is its apparent magnitude? And this is kind of the sort of putting together the two pieces of the math uh, that we need here. So I'm going to open up the ePoll and make one more amendment, um, which is uh, something that you may have not uh, recalled here, but you should know that the distance is equal to one parsec times the parallax uh, or one arc second over the parallax. So I've given you that as 50 milli arc seconds, so you should be all good in uh, putting those pieces together. So, yep, we're off and running. All right, let's call that a wrap uh, for now. I'm gonna leave it open if you've got to get your answer in. So to solve this, we'll um, basically isolate for the apparent magnitude, which is right there. Uh, so what we want to do is uh, pull uh, this formula and we'll just go ahead and say the apparent magnitude is the absolute magnitude plus five times log 10 uh, D over 10 parsecs. The distance here, is, we just go over and use the, di is form the distance formula. We plug in d is one parsec times one arc second over 50 milli arc seconds is 0 0.05 regular arc seconds. So one over 0 0.05, that goes to 20. So this is 20 parsecs. And so the magnitude is plus 3.1 plus five log 10 of 20 parsecs over 10 parsecs, and you stick that into your calculator, you pop out a 4.6. So most of you were converging in that direction, so good on you. Okay, any questions about that? All right, seeing not much, uh, let's move on. Uh, the last thing I wanna talk about really quickly is this idea of proper motion. So proper motion is contrasted with parallax motion. 
Uh, parallax is this kind of, I'm going to say optical illusion, uh, but it's a change in perspective leads to the star's motion. The proper motion is the fact that the stars move legitimately across the sky. And so we measure this by changing, they're changing coordinates over the course of time, and it's measured in units of angular speed. So if we go into the Gaia data, it will be giving us proper motions in milli arc seconds per year or arc seconds per year. Uh, and it's usually measured in terms of two components. Uh, for example, we could measure it in the right ascension and declination frame, and we would get a term that's mu a cos dec, and then mu dec, uh, is where mu is the proper motion here. And that cos dec uh, shows up just because of the convergence of latitude lines as you go up towards the pole. Uh, so this kind of puts the right ascension and declination angles on the same values. And if you use the small angle formula and uh, plug in a proper motion uh, scaled to one arc seconds per year and a distance to the star in parsecs, you can figure out how fast it's moving across the sky. And this is sometimes called the tangential or perpendicular velocity. So if we're sitting here and we look out at a star, it's going to have two components. It has this tangential velocity, uh, which is going to be the component of the velocity vector sort of projected in uh, uh, to the plane of the sky. And that'll be manifested through the proper motion vector. And then we'll have this additional pair parallel motion or radial component to the motion. And that can't be measured with the proper motion. It just gets farther and farther away from us. And we could measure that motion by sort of watching the star apparently get dimmer or something like that. But uh, that's not nearly as useful as using the measurement of the radial velocity through the Doppler shift. And so we usually assess how quickly a star is moving towards us or away from us using the Doppler shift of the spectral lines. Here is the non-relativistic wavelength form of the Doppler effect. It's the usual, you know, delta lambda over lambda is V over C. Uh, formulation of this expression. And so usually when I give you this, you be given a wavelength that it's observed at, a rest wavelength, or knowledge of how to calculate a rest wavelength, and then you can figure out how fast the star is moving towards us away from us. Just recapitulating what we said uh, last Friday is that positive means it's moving away from us. And so you'll note that if I have a proper motion and a parallax, as well as a radial velocity, uh, then I can figure out this full velocity vector in three dimensions and all of its components, which is, yeah, that's pretty cool. We can figure out how these stars are moving. Just as an aside, like we can only measure the proper motions of stars that are relatively close to us. So within our kind of quarter or fifth of the galaxy, this area. We can't measure proper motions of things in other galaxies very effectively uh, or you know things across the universe. This is really, when we talk about proper motion, we're thinking about stars moving near us. Okay, so as an example of bringing this all together, I can say if a star has a total proper motion, mu, of 30 milli arc seconds per year, a parallax of 15 milli arc seconds, and the spectral line H beta, which is normally has a lambda rest of 486.1 nanometers, true fact, and an observed wavelength of 486.4 nanometers, I want to know what is the magnitude of the velocity vector with respect to the Earth in units of kilometers per second. So given all of this together, we can sort of put these two pieces here. Um, I think it's that one. Yeah. All right, so, right. As you get going on this, you can use the proper motion pieces here, which are the proper motion, and then the parallax will give me the distance, and that'll go into the uh, perpendicular velocity vector. And then the uh, wavelengths here, they'll go into the radial motion, and from there, it's Pythagorean theorem. I'll let you run with that for a little bit, and then I'll start kind of coming along and sweeper, play sweeper.
All right, as we're coming along here, uh, I've set things up. Uh, so I've set up the, with the Doppler formula using the observed and the rest wavelength. And I just plug that in here to the formula uh, here. And I use 3 times 10 to the 5, 3.0 times 10 to the 5 for the speed of light, because that'll put it into kilometers per second. And uh, doing that chunk gives me about 185 kilometers per second, which precision should matter here. Next piece, what I did was I put in 4.74 kilometers per second, which is the scaling. I put in 30 milli arc seconds per year, uh, which is 0.03 arc seconds per year, so that cancels out. And then for the distance over parsecs, I put the in 1 over the parallax, so 1 over 0 0.015, the 15 milli arc seconds. And that will give me, as we go, uh, that'll give me a measly 9.48 kilometers per second. Finally, we can use Pythagorean theorem to figure out the magnitude of that velocity vector, which is the square root of vr squared plus the v perp squared, or v parallel squared plus v perp squared, and that's not much different, 185.25-ish kilometers per second. And here it actually matters where you have rounded your um, uh, initial Doppler velocity to, you'll get different values, 184, 185, or whatever, just because it's you know, dominates this uh, sort of Pythagorean sum, uh, the tangential velocity doesn't matter too much. Okay. Uh, any questions on how that went? All right. So I've kind of reached the end of what I wanted to talk about in terms of the sort of astro reprisal content. I wanted to go and sort of pivot to uh, the journal article uh, presentation at this point. So uh, I'm going to close up this particular epoll and we'll hop over. Uh, Got to click this button. Okay. Uh, some of you, this may be sort of old news, um, but I hope it's uh, nonetheless sort of illuminating anyway. So this is just a presentation of uh, sort of how to go through a journal article in details. And I've got a journal article for us to kind of consider. And over the next um, uh, couple of weeks, we're going to be reading different parts of this journal article. Um, but to get started, what is a journal article? Uh, the button I want is that one. All right. So the journal article is often what we call the scientific literature, or sometimes just the literature. It's uh, the main way that scientists report science to other scientists. It's sort of where we put stuff into the record of um, you know, what scientific progress is. The kind of gold standard of journal articles is what we call the refereed article, which means that when you have something to say in science, you write it up into this sort of specific format, and then you send it off to uh, a refereeing service. And those referees are one or more experts in your field. And I use experts here in quotes because they are, they should know something about it, but the refereeing process is somewhat, uh, you know, it's, it's random, uh, the quality of the refereeing you get. Uh, and you should understand that refereeing doesn't necessarily mean correct. When you are a referee, you read an article and you're giving it a sanity check. You're saying, does this make sense? Does this conclusion follow from what uh, was stated? It is not the place of a referee to reproduce the research that is in the article there. That would be fantastic for the quality of stuff that would make it into the literature, but it would kind of destroy science. Instead, the process of science kind of in, is the interaction of journal articles with each other. Somebody will report in a later article that they were unable to reproduce the results of a former article. And that uh, is, and then eventually that, that sort of 
sways out. You may have heard in psychology there's this thing that's called the reproducibility crisis, and that's just because you have all these articles in the literature and somebody said, that's an interesting experiment. I should try that. And then it just never falls, follows out uh, the way. And you get something like 5% of psychology re uh, results are uh, actually stand up and are reproducible. It's, um, yeah, it's, it is something that you should understand the nature of what science actually looks like. Uh, journal articles are often published in uh, journals. And journals are the people who sort of run the refereeing process. Uh, these are publishing services, and some of them are for profit, which as soon as you build in for profit with science, you can sort of go, hmm, what is the actual incentive that I am developing here? So there's a lot that you could look at the scientific literature and start to think, this seems to be maybe a little sketchier than this golden bastion of knowledge that we have running forward that you see presented to you in first year or in high school. Instead, it's a human process. Science is an amazing system. Scientists are human. And so this is an iterative process as we're sort of circling around the nature of science. We are humans interacting with this kind of ideal form of sort of a dialogue with the natural universe. So the astronomy journals that we'll be sort of dealing with are uh, fall in a couple categories. I'm just going to give you a wall of text here so that when I say an abbreviation, you kind of have a vague mapping on what that means. Uh, there are several major journals. These are the mainline article uh, journals that host most astrophysical research. Uh, there's several run by the Astro the American Astronomical Society, uh, uh, or sometimes called the AAS. Uh, and these are uh, sort of the ones that are more North American focused. That's the Astrophysical Journal, and most papers go into the Astrophysical Journal, or APJ. Uh, then there's AJ, or the Astronomical Journal, and that tends to focus a little bit more on data and observations. Astrophysics is supposed to be about, well, what is the physical interpretation of these results we see. It's a gray line. You can sort of submit to either one. And then they have this thing that's called APJ letters, or more recently, the AAS letters. And those are very short articles, only five or six pages, on timely results. It's hard to read letters because they are very very much embedded in knowing a lot more about the field. So a lot of the articles we're going to read are not going to focus on these relatively high impact letters. We'll focus more on original articles. And we'll read probably three different articles through this course. The European Southern Observatory is operated out of Europe, and they operate the Astronomy and Astrophysics Journal, so it's called ANA. So that's sort of European focused, and if you're a member of the European Astronomical Society, you can publish in ANA for a reduced rate here, and more on costs later. Uh, and then the Royal Astronomical Society uh, is run through the UK, and that's the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society, pronounced MINRAS, and there's even a closing bracket if I do it correctly. Uh, this is the journal that I like to publish in because it's cheap, and I am fundamentally a penny-pinching cheapskate, and they don't give us a lot of research funding in Canada, which is fine, uh, so yeah, whatever. It's where we send the articles because, you know, it's uh, lo low cost to me. Uh, on my article. You may have heard of some major journals. These are the pan science journals, um, and those are nature and science. And so these are fundamentally what I would call sensational journals. These are the things that seem like they're going to be really major results. But um, I think the upshot of nature and science, at least in astrophysics, is that half of the articles in nature and science turn out to be wrong. You just don't know which half. Uh, and that's because these are often like, this is the first result. This is the, you know, best. This is like, so you're looking for superlatives if you want to get into nature or science. And so this is often the big, like, pinnacle of like, oh, I have three nature articles or something like that. Uh, but practically, you kind of get pushed to high stakes when you're going for these journals. In general, the mainline journals have much more sort of solid citizen, one foot in front of the other results that are kind of well-baked. Uh, nature and science can end up a little half-baked uh, 
because there's, you know, it's a lot of, um, you know, you tell your colleagues that you got a nature article. There's a bounty in like, for example, uh, in, if you're doing research in China, there's a bounty on getting nature and science articles. You literally get money paid to you if you can publish in nature or science. And so as soon as you inject raises into something, the, the, the metrics get a little weird. Um, Something that's actually really useful are these uh, review article journals. And here they solicit specific reviews where people go and they look at all of the literature in a field, say on star formation, and you write an annual review, which sort of summarizes, okay, this is what's happened over the past several years in star formation. And there's about 20 or 30 annual review articles published each year on various topics, everything from the sun to galaxy evolution. So that's really useful for somebody coming in at kind of the senior undergraduate graduate student level and saying, all right, I understand what I've seen in my Astro 322 class, well, what do I do now if I want to kind of dive into research on something? So these annual reviews, uh, uh, A-R-A-N-A, -A, or annual reviews, is uh, a good source, and then space science reviews. Uh, and then there's some other major journals published by astronomical societies of various places. Uh, Japan, Australia, and the Pacific tend to be the sort of uh, other places where you'll see some literature published uh, in those you know, regions of the world. They're a little bit more regional. Um, all of these journals are accessible through the library. We'll get into how to actually grab articles out of them in a little bit. But these are the articles that we are dealing with and my editorialization of them. So how do you make a journal article? Well, you get uh, researchers like me and maybe you too, and you write an article and you sort of type it up. It's a lot like writing a big report, except we did some science and then we write up the report about the science and then you submit it. And when you submit it, it goes to an editor. And the editors are, you know, there's you know 10 to 15 editors for these mainline journals and they read it and they say, is this suitable content for our journal? And there's a lot of people who will send articles in that are, you know, basically saying, what if gravity worked backwards? The sun pushes things away from it. And stuff like that tends to be sort of rejected at the editor level. But in astronomy, almost always, if you're publishing sort of basic astronomical research that is, you know, incremental in the field and is sort of a specific area, it goes out to what's called a referee. Uh, the refer editor's job is to find referees who are experts in this. Usually it's one in the mainline journals. It's anon It can be anonymous, so you don't know who is refereeing. I tend to sign all my referee reports because, you know, if you can't say something to somebody's face, then, you know, you should probably shouldn't say it. So I, I believe in sort of signing so people know where I'm coming from. Uh, anyways, editor finds a referee and then the referee sits down with the paper and gives it this sanity check. Reads through it. Does this make sense? Did this conclusion actually follow from this? Is it, did their data seem problematic? Did they know about the right things in the literature? You know, so it does that. And then you write up a report. You type it up. It's, you know, two, three, ten pages long about, like, here's what I think you need to change about your journal uh, article. And the re referee recommends to the editor. The editor uh, can either accept it and say, this was a good article. We're going to put it in the journal. Uh, the editor can return it to the authors for revision, usually with referee report attached. Or the editor can be like, eh, no, not good. And then that gets uh, rejected. And so then you no longer will submit that article to this journal. If the authors get revised, uh, then it will go back and sort of continue around this loop until you get a referee uh, saying, oh yeah, this is acceptable. And usually when you're refereeing, you get to see later revisions. So you say, they should totally make the units on this scale solar masses instead of micrograms. And then they make those changes. You can come back and go, looks good. And then you write to the editor and the editor says, okay, sounds good, we'll put it into our journal. I'll note that astronomy is very different from other fields. Uh, for example, my spouse has to publish in medical journals and medical journals are very, shall we say, choosy. And there's so much more that happens at the editorial stage 
uh, the editor gets it and he's like, mm, I don't think this is good for our journal. And then they just send it off and be like, no, not going to even go to a referee yet. Instead, what happens then is that the authors get it back and be like, all right, let's try another journal. So you sort of work through, and then there's this kind of hierarchy of journals. You start out at the Lancet level, and then you move down to, and eventually you're at the Edmonton local journal of, you know, livers or something like that. And, you know, so it works. Uh, there's a bit of a hierarchy. In astronomy, we're very permissive in what goes to referees and gets accepted into the literature. We sort of have a, yeah, get everything out there so we're talking about it, and that's the place where we want to be. And I think that's probably good for science. And the main reason it's good for science is that it's pretty easy to find stuff in astronomy. The other thing that's kind of cool is this thing that's called the archive. That's A-R, and that's supposed to be a Greek letter chi in the middle. So this is the archive. Yeah, it looks like archiv, but we say Archive. And Archive is this service that is supported by philanthropy. Like I've donated to Archive and, you know, it's run, but, you know, support from like these wealthy foundations uh, and is based out of Cornell University. And this is a free to access place where you can just put up a scientific transaction. Boop, out goes piece of science goes up on there and anyone can post there, but spam gets removed. So if you're making your great case that, uh, you know, gravity is backwards and Newton had it wrong, that's probably not gonna quite get up there. You've gotta have some backing, but there are some really interesting things on the archive and you can literally see flame wars on the archive, like one day to the next where people are sort of, you know, well, you know, and it's like little two page, like scientific uh, dialogues. Journals can't do that, but the archive allows there to be this kind of fast dialogue between uh, uh, people. And it's not just astrophysics. We were one of the first disciplines in here, but it now there's archive for biology, archive for, I think even psychology now has archive contributions. Uh, so you can really find anything here. And almost all articles that get published in regular journals get submitted here uh, as well. So there's always kind of a freely accessible copy to it uh, here. So Archive's a great resource, but it is not refereed. Uh, you can just put your stuff up there, and usually you put a little note in it that says, uh, hey, let me go to the archive and, um, uh, you know, uh, sorry, let me go to the archive and just put a little note that says, accepted to AppJ. And that just means it's been refereed. Here's a free copy of it here. Uh, yeah, we uh, note in lecture questions that, yeah, April Fools on the archive, quality. It's, it's very good uh, uh, because there's a lot of trying to sort of sneak things through. Uh, our, in astronomy, the uh, super huge interferometric telescope was one of our, you know, something I certainly remember from my graduate uh, days of, you know, something that get posted on April first. So deal with the April 1st postings with a little grain of salt. All right. So how do we actually find an article? Well, uh, we're going to be studying this article called, uh, that's referenced, if you like look in the book, uh, and you'll see these little references, these internal references that look like this. Gaia Collaboration et al. 2018. Uh, Gaia Collaboration is, whoever's there is usually the first author. Uh, and since this article is kind of published by a collaboration, they sort of report them as Gaia Collaboration. Sometimes you'll see something like, you know, this chucklehead Rosaleski et al. shows up there uh, and everything. Uh, and that's how it shows up in the line of like a book or your uh, literature here. Uh, et al. just means and others, you know, Latin because, you know, that's cool. And then the publication year. It looks like my text has shifted from where my arrows are supposed to be. And then you're like, okay, well, what is that reference? You go into the back of the article and you see a slightly expanded string here. Uh, Gaia Collaboration, Babusio, at Van Leeuwen et al. 2018. So we get a couple more authors. That's useful. We get the year. We get what journal it's published in, ANA. And I know, having stared at this for long enough, that means astronomy and astrophysics. That's the European journal, European Southern Observatory. It's probably coming out of Europe. Then you have 616 and A10. That's the volume and the page. Back in the days when they printed journals, nobody gets paper journals anymore. They're almost all digital distribution. And then there's this thing that's called a DOI or a digital object identifier. 
Uh, and that DOI is useful if you need to find an article uh, here uh, and you have it, it makes it easy to find. And the way we want to find these things are from what's called the abstract data system or, or the NASA ADS or Smithsonian Astrophysical NASA uh, Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory, NASA Astrophysics Data System. And this is an amazing service. It's kind of led the field in astrophysics and it's expanding out into physics and other branches of science now. It's a really nice bibliographic uh, system. So if we want to find any articles and NASA ADS is the way to do it. And this is the URL. You can also Google uh, SAO NASA ADS and that will find it. If you search for ADS, you tend to find ads um, and you know, for your advertisements and stuff. So uh, I'll pop this open, but I might have to mess with my camera a little bit. Uh, I'll pause now and take any questions while I set up my camera uh, for a moment. Hmm, what's going on? Today is the day that the website is downloading assets for a disturbingly long period of time. At least no sound in dark mode. Nope. Hey, that's where it ended up. So, uh, great. Let's, instead of looking at that, let's go and pull up ADS and see if this loads. Hmm. <clears throat> Not a good day to actually do a live demo. Oh well. Getting there? Getting there? I'm just checking to see if there's any questions that have popped up. <sighs> All right. We will call internet and we'll hit one more reload and then we'll call the internet broken and call it a day. Uh, okay, we'll go over ADS use later. Maybe at the end of the class when the internet came back. Clearly I'm talking to you, so I'm gonna blame it on that end. Or maybe no one's there anymore. Oh, oh, hi, there you are. Okay, well, let's uh, hop on back over here to, boom, there we go. Uh, I didn't see any questions came up in my little bit of dead air. So, keep going. Okay, next thing I'd like to talk about is briefly how to read a journal article, which and journal articles typically follow this uh, a style that was popularized back in the 1700s uh, that's briefly called IMRAD. And most science articles follow uh, the IMRAD, which is introduction, method, results, and discussion. But in science, we tend to add on a few other pieces here. We throw in an abstract, we put in some conclusions and summaries, and then references in an appendix. But IMRAD is kind of the core of a journal article. And so I want to present the journal article that I was going to download live for you in front of your eyes. I was going to use the internet, but instead you're gonna get uh, this article. And this is something from Gaia, shocking. Uh, and it's about observational Hertzsprung-Russell diagrams. And it's gonna talk about how they make observational HR diagrams with Gaia and some of the things that they get out of it. And this is an article that was uh, with Gaia data release two here. So uh, if you go through it, you'll see that there's, this, like, this is le just legitimately what this looks like. And we wanna talk a bit about all these pieces of a journal article, and then I'll ask you to kind of go and give it a little bit of a browse through it. Um, so coming back here, when you look at the front of a uh, journal article, first thing you notice, especially with this one, is a giant wall of authors. Uh, you know, you can have journal articles with one or two or four people who actually all contribute, but when you see something like this, you see this giant wall of text that's just the people's names who have signed this article. Uh, and there's a Gaia collaboration, but uh, yeah, you look at the first name after it says Gaia collaboration, that person probably did 90% of the work on this article. Don't know, 
I'm sure it was a helpful collaboration in some ways, but you get these thousand author articles where one person did most of the work, but it was enabled by everybody else on the journal article. And so that's where we put it together. Uh, the trick to sort of parsing these things in astrophysics is to kind of look at the block here before it goes into this long list of alphabetized by last name. This sort of shows up as kind of having sort of a weird random order. So maybe there is some uh, bit of intellectual credit that could be distributed among this group. It's probably a working group that had to uh, deal with uh, this and sort of develop this authorship. But it was probably just that first author or the first couple authors who did most of the research. And then once you get down here into the end, this is a giant alphabetical block. They built a satellite. That's pretty cool. And as a result, they get to sign these journal articles as well, uh, because, you know, without building a satellite, you wouldn't be here doing the science. Then you go into the abstract. Uh, the abstract is a complete summary of a paper. You should be able to read the abstract and sort of understand all of the results of the paper, how and they did it. And ANA uses what's called a structured abstract format. And you can see up here that they have context, aims, methods, results, and conclusions. And they just kind of give you a couple sentence summary of each of those. And we are starting to understand almost all of these words. And in a couple weeks, you'll be able to read this and be like, I know everything in that abstract. I own this piece. That thing at the end called keywords, uh, that's a little bit deprecated. Back in the day before there was NASA ADS, there used to be these giant indices. And so you could go and find the articles based on the keywords associated. But you still have to declare what the keywords are. And then you get into the introduction. The introduction is often the most useful part of the paper for somebody coming in from the outside. And a good introduction is gold. It's just amazing. And the point of an introduction is to connect the reader who knows nothing about the specific article, but out there in the general field, down into the current article. You should start out really general. Oh, the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram is one of the most important tools in stellar studies. That sounds like something I would say to you in class, very general. And, and then it defines what an HR diagram is, and it moves on. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Uh, and then the other thing that it does is it calls out relevant previous work. It should motivate why you're doing this paper, and it should lay out the structure of the paper so you can kind of navigate through it. If you go through the, uh, the introduction, you can find the motivation for this particular article. Up to now, the most complete solar neighborhood empirical HRD, Hertzsprung Russell diagram, could be attained by combining Hipparchos. Okay, that's pretty good. Oh, so a bit about like why clusters are important. But then, um, to be conclusive, they need homogeneous photometry for intercomparisons and astrometry for good memberships. Hmm, sounds like there's a need here. And then in the next paragraph, they whip out and they say, all right, turns out that Gaia is amazing. You know, we're going to do amazing work here with Gaia. And then they will say, here's why this article is going to be so awesome. So they just kind of put all these pieces that are all laid out here. And I, Gaia is awesome. They are entitled to a little bit of pride. This is an amazing uh, system. Then you move into methods. Methods is, um, in theory, what you need to reproduce the results. In practice, usually what you do is enough to conclude uh, that you know, they did things reasonably well. This is high quality work. So you need to address questions of quality, not necessarily complete reproducibility here. And if you read through the methods, it sort of lays out some of the introduction, but then it also puts in a piece here that's about like, oh, but this is also about handling extinction rigorously. And then we haven't talked about what extinction is, so we probably should get to that. Then it gives you a large wall of text about all these details that are important if you're trying to sort of sanity check the work here. Um, reading advice? Skim these and circle back if it seems important. You'd be like, okay, I remember there's definitely something here about like chi-squared. What's a chi-squared? Ah, maybe I'll find that out later and come back. So generally, if you hit blocks where you're like, this seems less important, go ahead and skim through it. And then you get into kind of the meat of this, which is we built Gaia HR diagrams by estimating the absolute magnitude in the G band, all words you know, uh, using G, which is the observed apparent magnitude, plus uh, us five, 
that's the over 10 parsecs that's usually there, plus 5 log 10 of, what the heck is that? Uh, looks like a little W with a hat on it. It turns out that that is their variable for parallax. Uh, it's actually a pi or a script pi. I'll sometimes call it a fancy pi as we go through here. So fancy pi is a measurement is the parallax in milli arc seconds plus the extinction, see next section. Um, and it's also worth it noting this article that sigma is the variable that astronomers use to indicate uncertainty. So sigma sub pi is the uncertainty in the error of the parallax. So this gives us the pieces that uh, we need to know and sort of sets up the, the math here. So fancy pi is uh, the parallax and when you see that in the article, that's what you should be thinking. And then, bam, out come the figures. This is the first figure in the paper. This is 65 million stars in Gaia put down into a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram of exquisite quality. So we've sort of laid this out and we saw 20,000 in our exercise last week. Here's the full 65 million of high quality Gaia observations from data release two. Uh, and then they use color here to kind of indicate the density of the stars here. Uh, question is, when these papers are written, do the authors upload relevant codes and data to GitHub or some other repository? Um, not as often as they should. I, I like open science and here's all my data and the code and results so you can check it. A lot of people uh, don't. So you can ask them and everything, and this is kind of the transaction, but that's sort of the detail. Uh, the, that is a dialogue that's evolving. We are trending much more towards completely open science. Here's my code, here's my data. This is the thing that writes the paper. That's where we should be, in my opinion. Uh, and then you get into situations like, okay, when you're looking at this, what do you actually do? Uh, this is from phdcomics.com. If you're interested in research in the sciences, it's a nice look at what uh, grad school is like. But uh, yeah, so read the abstract, look at the figures, and back to surfing the web. It is not wrong. Uh, the If you are skimming a journal article, you read the abstract, you look at the figures, and you'll often go to the summary and conclusions to get a little bit more detail. And then you use the figures as ways to sort of read chunks of the paper. It's very rare that people sit down and be like, I'm going to read this article front to back. <laughs> no, it's just a lot of hopping around here, and which is why I want to kind of give you this signposting here. And so uh, coming back to it, uh, I just want to say um, that if we read the text anchored to this figure, it says, here's figure one, all that, then go find where it discusses figure one in the text. And it shows up here, it says, okay, the absolute magnitude diagram presented in figure one, and then it talks about this extinction stuff. And so this extinction, oh, it's weird. Uh, what is it? Yeah, it's particularly striking for the red clump. Should probably understand what that is too. And so then they're going to proceed by selecting low extinction stars. And so that is where we will call it a cliffhanger. What's extinction? And uh, since I have run out of time, I will pick this up on Monday and we'll discuss a little bit more about what extinction is. It turns out that it's important and how to continue reading this journal article. All right. Uh, thanks everyone for dialing in today. Uh, I'll talk to you on Monday in this same time um, and have a lovely weekend. Bye all.